Welcome back to part two. Guys, we had so much information. You know, we get all these audio engineers and we're talking. We've been in quarantine way too long. And the console has such a broad feature set that we had to break it into two parts. So once again, the Yamaha PM5, live from the CTS Learning Lab. So the next thing we should talk about here, Russ, uh, is I would love to know more about all of the new feature sets with meters and encoders and how the PM5 does all of that with, with the surface being shrunk to be more ergonomic, smaller, you know, it's got a lot of great, great things that uh, they pulled up on the screen. So we now have more touch access, more stuff. And, and so walk us through some of that stuff. That's pretty incredible. Yeah. So like I mentioned earlier, the distance between the top of the fader and the screen is half of what it was on the tin. And that's because they've condensed it by changing multiple things. We've lost a row of encoders. We've lost the scribble strip. The metering has all went next to the faders. Um, and let's walk through each of those things. The metering, uh, even though it's, it's not a dedicated meter, it's next to the fader, it's actually far easier to see what's going on and, and is more accurate, far, far more segments. So I think people are gonna love that. It's really bright, easy to see from uh, even at a distance. Um, if you look over here, you can see that there are stereo meters as well as, uh, as mono meters, uh, depending on if your configuration is a stereo or mono channel. There's two separate dynamics meters for each uh, channel as well. So you can see exactly what's happening. Uh, the scribble strip is gone, uh, which to me, I was really worried about that at first uh, because I thought, you know, I rely on looking at the scribble strip a lot, but they've changed the, the way the channels are labeled on the screen and the font is, is much bigger and uh, it's really clear. And, and with that decreased distance between the fader and the screen, you don't miss the scribble strip uh, being gone at all. It's really easy to see what's going on. So that whole configuration uh, is really great on the five. So the, the five has a, a smaller selected channel because of the third screen and gone are the dedicated knobs for send and matrix, uh, matrix sends. So that's been replaced by a software adjustment and it's really easy to scroll through all the inputs and then once you get to the input, you can use uh, your encoder to dial in the amount or if, if you've got a stereo mix or a stereo matrix you can adjust the panning as well and uh, it's really easy to pop that open and, uh, and close it to get to those adjustments so I think people are really gonna like that um, the other thing with just one row of encoders here you choose whether you're using these as screen encoders or you're using them as channel strip encoders you've got a dedicated channel strip and screen encoders on the 10 and the 7 but uh, on this console, uh, if it's on screen encoders, then when I'm on an EQ or something like that, then um, these encoders will uh, adjust what's on the screen. Or if I go to channel strip encoders, they can be used for analog gain or whatever I've predefined in my preferences. But uh, like the 10, you've got five different options to toggle between, and uh, there's a strip at the bottom that lets you know if you're on, uh, if you're on the channel strip encoder and what, what option is selected. You can see that the, the um, scribble strip gets slightly smaller when you do that. Um, but those are the big differences between the layout of the, uh, of the five in comparison to the 10. And one other thing that I, I want to throw out there that we were talking about earlier, Chris was showing me that on um, the Revage platform, any of the consoles, that the meters across the top of the screens, as well as the actual meter page, has all been updated to be a smoother uh, meter that is very accurate, very transient, but it's, a, it's an updated meter. And that's, that's on all of the consoles, right? Yeah. yeah, it's more of a liquid looking meter and it's it's great and, and I can like right now I'm looking at channels one through 144 inputs, but I can actually uh, go to uh, look at all 288 inputs and um,
simultaneously. And even at that small meter with this new metering type, I can see pretty clearly all 288 uh, inputs. But if I had a large uh, channel count show, I think I would set my first screen up to look at the first 144, then this second screen for 145 to 288, and then I'd look at my output, so my third screen. Yeah, let's throw this up behind us and we can take a look and see what that, just to give an idea of that full screen meter effect, which again is just another great tool, especially on a high input show. You know, you guys have both mixed a lot of symphony dates and things where you have lots of bands, lots of inputs. And so the ability to have really great metering is a really cool tool at your disposal to be able to look over, especially, man, tell me how many times have you guys had you know, 60 string mics and somebody inevitably steps on, pops, something pops in the system and you look over and boom, you can see exactly what it is. Right. Get the text to fix it, you know. And it's, if it pops, it, it's probably going to pop again and you don't have time to wait. You don't want to have a dozen pops before you figure out where that, that problem channel is. Another great uh, thing about this meter window is you can click on the number below the, the meters and you can actually, instead of looking at the fader value, you can look at the channel name. So like you said, if I'm dealing with a large symphony, that makes it even easier to see exactly where a problem is. Yeah, that's, that's pretty powerful. I mean, that, that is a really, really great tool to have at your disposal, especially, you know, large channel count show, you know, who knows what that was. There's so many people on stage, so much going on. That's, that's pretty cool. And that exists on all of the, you know, whether it's the 3, the 7, the 10, the that's 5, right. it's there. That's pretty cool. So, guys, another thing that is really cool about these consoles that has been updated, um, certainly with version 4 and also with the new uh, Surface, is that the custom fader banks as well as the updated input count, which went from 144, now it's 288. Uh, walk us through what that looks like with the physical button button pushes and how that lays out and how you toggle between layers and things because I know it's changed on the 10 but also there's just new features in how it's designed on the 5. Walk us through that. What does that look like? Well, it's, so it's basically the same, same operation on the, the 5 and the 7 and the 10 and the 3. All, all four surfaces have the same operation but um, the uh, where before there were two input banks, uh, each of them with 72 inputs. Now you can get to the next, you know, from channel 145 and up, you press those two uh, inputs together and then it flips to 280, to 145 to 288. So now I'm able to toggle through the additional. And it, and it changes color as well to help indicate yeah, that so you're on the Yeah, so if you see the blue, second. you know you're on the, the second uh, set and if you're on green you're on the first set so that's your input channels and it's pretty natural f workflow and and uh, and will feel pretty much the same as it's felt it's just that you've got twice as many inputs uh, your custom fader banks where you had two banks of six before uh, now uh, I go to cust I can hold the custom button and it enters into the custom uh, fader bank selection and then I can scroll through banks and there's five banks um, and each one of those has uh, six options. So I've got 30, uh, 30 banks now um, instead of 12. That's incredible. And then that, that exists for all three fader banks, so you can have each one. That's right. That, that's, that's unbelievable. Yeah, that's nuts. And then that is also reflected on the 10 as well. Yes, you can uh, push the two input buttons together. The colors change on the selected channel so you can get to the 145 to 288 and on the custom fader banks it operates just to, it, the same way you hold the both custom fader you go into custom fader banks and you use the uh, five buttons the inputs the mix and the matrix buttons to scroll through the custom fader banks and to get out of it you do the same thing hold it down wow man that is that is a lot of stuff to be able to toggle through. That's pretty cool. Yeah, the, the cool thing about the, the 10 is that it operates identical to the way it always has um, until you increase the channel count number. So there's you know uh, no real changes. And that's always a key to Yamaha is, is making sure you don't have to re 
learn a new way of doing something. So the people who are used to using this console, it works the same way for them, but yet we've got all this added flexibility. Guys, the next thing I would like to talk about is I would like to talk about the, um, the onboard USB recorder, which is a really cool, really cool thing, uh, especially if you're just gonna make a two track of your event or your show to hand to the artist at the end of the night. And I think uh, it's just such a cool platform. Russ, tell us a little bit about this recorder and I can throw it up here on screen. Well, no surprise you can record a, a stereo mix at the sample rate that the console set at, you know, a 96K 24-bit file, which if, if the quality is important, that's of course what you want to do. But you also have the option of, uh, of recording an MP3 file, and there's various qualities of MP3, as well as you can do 16 or 24-bit uh, WAV files or, or any sample rate. So it's, it's really flexible. If, if it's just a rough mix of the, I mean, a board mix of the show that the band needs to reference, then there's no reason to you know, use all the space required to make it a 96K file. It, it's easy to make it an MP3, it's quicker to, to upload, and it's really easy to let people download it. Um, but if it's more important that you um, have a higher quality, you can do that. Now, of course, that doesn't have to be just your, your stereo bus. You can choose the source from anywhere. So if you've got some audience mics set up and for your reference mix, you want to have some audience built in or something like that, you also have that option. So there's a whole lot of flexibility in, uh, in what you can do to create that mix. Man, yeah, I've always, that's been one of those things that has been so cool to be able to do that without having to have an external recorder. You have the drive plugged in. And I know for myself, I love that with the user defined keys, I have an auto start and an auto stop. So when we get ready to start the show, I punch a button on the console and boom, we start recording. I have a matrix that has a blend of those audience mics, like you said, and it has, you know, the, right. the mix. And then at the end of the night, boom, stop. It's a, it's a simple MP3 format. I could make it a WAV format if I need to, but then it's very easy to just plug in, upload, and, you know, your artist or whoever management has an archival copy or a reference. And that's just, that's really convenient, the fact that it's all built into the same package. And I'll, I'll say too, I love the fact that you guys on the, on the console, all of the consoles have both a USB and a USB dedicated recording port right on the surface. So I can have my uh, USB key for audio recording as well as a USB key just to store show files. And I'm not necessarily sharing those drives. Hey, Chris, um, tell me about the ability to do multi-track recording on this platform. I think it's got some really great features and just the way that it's integrated. You know, Russ had talked about USB recording. Let's talk about multi-track recording for a minute. What are all the ways that we can do that? And, and, and just walk us through that world. Okay, well, slot four in the DSP is dedicated for virtual sound check. You can use it for other things, but it's the only card slot that you can actually do a virtual sound check on. Uh, and it has the ability just to put either a Dante card or a uh, Matty card in there to record. The Dante for Yamaha is the easiest because we, we sell a Dante accelerator card that allows you to record 128 channels into your laptop. And, uh, but you have the ability to connect any kind of uh, DAW you want to as long as it can connect via Matty or Dante. Man, that's pretty awesome. Um, that's just fantastic. Love it. Uh, guys, let's talk a little bit about some of the plug-in features that we have. You guys have invested a lot of time and energy into partnering with different manufacturers. You guys have a long history and a legacy of great uh, internal effects and things. But let's talk about some of the things that are on here. Um, I'm going to throw this up on screen. And Russ, can you just walk us through this new Eventide Reverb. This just looks amazing. I know that a lot of guys in Studio World have used this for years. Tell us about this. So the Eventide SP2016 is an emulation of the classic SP2016 uh, Reverb from the 1980s. And it is a fabulous sounding uh, Reverb that was a, a high-end studio staple for, for a long period of time. It's been used on tons and tons of hit records and um, and now it's available in every Revage console. Uh, there are a load of algorithms, six different algorithms, both vintage and modern versions of three different algorithms in the 
vintage versions are an emulation of a low bit rate uh, sound. So they've got that grit to them that, uh, you know, that an old school reverb has and, um, and that kind of rough glue that can sometimes bring a, a drum set sound together or, or electric guitars, all kinds of stuff like that. And then it also has more modern algorithms, the pristine uh, sound for a, vocal, for a vocal reverb or for an acoustic instrument. Uh, let me walk through the, the controls here with, with you real quick. Uh, there's input, um, output, and mix controls. And if you're inserting this on a channel, uh, you may get a, a mix, a reverb level a setting that you like and an input and output. Then you can do a lock and uh, you can lock the mix and lock the I.O. And then as you step through presets, those controls are locked and that allows you to hear that exact same blend instead of having to go back and change the blend every time you recall a new preset. And of course, for some reason, if you do want to call recall the input and output settings saved with that preset, you can turn those lock functions off. Uh, there's a kill function that lets you stop the input stop the input signal and just hear the tail of the reverb uh, to, to hear how it, uh, it trails off if you're listening to the full trail of a reverb sound as you're auditioning sounds and, and sorting out what you're going to use. The metering can be uh, selected as either the input or the output and then you have um, a whole host of controls. You've got pre-delay which is standard pre-delay, uh, the decay time, uh, then the position allows you to place that uh, virtually place that sound in either the front of the space or the rear of the space. And to me, it doesn't necessarily feel like it's moving front or rear of the room, but it does change the, the sonic texture of the, of the reverb and really allows you to, to shape the, the reverb for your, uh, for your specific needs. Uh, and then there's a diffusion uh, control as well. Uh, high shelf and low shelf EQs let you shape that EQ for your, right, uh, your, your needs and um, it's really, really flexible, really, really flexible reverb. Uh, the presets that come with it, there's several artist presets, which is a, a, great, uh, a great thing. Joe Ciccarelli, George Massenberg, Dave Pinsato, who are studio legends, all have presets in there. Um, there's some lesser known people like the Butcher Brothers and Brian Montgomery, who also have, and, and others, who have a lot of great reverbs, uh, presets to choose from. So. Uh, the way I've been using it, I'll start, uh, you know, dial it in on a sound and then just toggle through the presets until I get one that sounds in the ballpark and then I'll go through and tweak it and shape it into what, uh, what I need to use it for. But it's really great. Uh, one of the main reasons people go outside of the Rivage for processing is to get additional reverb options and, um, and this gives them a whole new palette of, of options um, and, and the stability of staying inside the desk and, and a, a lot of artistic options to choose from. So I'm really excited about it. That is fantastic. Thanks, Russ. Um, while we're talking about Aventide, one of the things that is really great was that this was also released with an H3000, which is one of the uh, best, if not the best, when it comes to doubling and, and pitch shifting and coursing and some of that stuff as far as outboard pieces go. Chris, why don't you walk us through that? Tell us your thoughts on that and, and, and let me know, you know, you, you helped develop this and put this in and tell us about that. Well, I mean, it's always, a, uh, the, it's always been a favorite product of mine to use mixing in, uh, as an outboard piece of gear and I've never found anything that actually equaled the things that it did. Uh, you know, if you wanted to have uh, a Def Leppard guitar sound, that was uh, the harmonizers. Uh, you can do doubling, all kinds of different things that, that you've heard from artists all over the world are, is that product. And so far, I've never found anything that recreates that sound. So it's pretty unique um, in, in that respect. I mean, unique enough that I own several and uh, of the analog pieces. But uh, it's it's my one of my favorite plugins in the in the console. Yeah, that's really cool. And I also I can't wait to hear. I, I've always liked really grungy, low bit reverb sounds for toms and stuff like that. I'm kind of interested in using this uh, 2016 also too. Next time I get to mix something. Yeah, yeah. I hauled a 
H3000 around with me just for the micro pitch shift and, and the way it sounded on background vocals for years and years. And I love having that inside the console. Yeah, and it is exactly the same. I've, I've done, you know, it it's doesn't have all of the, the preset, all of the algorithms in it that the unit has because of the limit, limitation of the DSP, but it has the ones that I use the most. Yeah, it has the ones that, I mean, I think all the go-to presets. And there is one big difference though. I, my um, H3000 had to go into the shop about every eight or nine months, and this one is never <laughs> broken down, so that's the yeah. biggest difference. <laughs> yeah, that is a difference, yeah. That's awesome. Hey Chris, so as we're talking about these things, another one of the pieces in this console that I really want to hear about is uh, this Rupert Nevy Q, and I'm going to pull it up here on screen. Uh, but this is a really cool piece, and I want to hear about your involvement, I want to hear about Rupert, I want to hear about this piece, and how it really became part of the console and really helped to shape the console into what it is now. Right. Uh this particular device um, is the analog pieces that exist today are very, very expensive and very sought after. And uh, uh, we wanted to make a decade style versions of Rupert Neve products, you know, and this was be, would be the 70s model. And uh, so this is, you know, a very sought after piece of gear. And uh, so we wanted to emulate it and in fact the transformer that's in the mic pre is the transformer emulation that's in this piece here so they took the transformer emulation of the 773 and put it into the input of the console uh, the there's a, a lot to say about it it's just a very musical very sought after eq but to kind of tell you a story about what happened here is that to tell you how exact these products are in the console, that when we made this the first time, we took it to um, Rupert Neve Designs and they checked it out and said it was wrong. And, and then we were, we were all shocked because this was one of the last pieces we made and because we'd been dead on the whole time. And so he said, well, let me hear the analog piece that you emulated. So he put up the analog piece that we emulated and he said, that is wrong. And he could hear the difference between somebody modifying his EQ, pulled it apart, all these parts are different, changed it back, we took it back and, and redid it. So it's, it's just a testament to how accurate these pieces are that Dr. K made to the original pieces that Rupert Neve. So Dr. Designed. K's version that he emulated was a, a device that had been modified. Right. That's amazing. Yeah, and then and, and, and more amazing than that, that they heard the difference. Right. You know, I've been setting, you know, we talk about sound a lot. I've been setting in the rooms a lot when they would, when you'd have these guys from Rupert Neve, including Mr. Neve himself, would go, uh, you know, they would say, well, it's got a little bit too much second harmonic distortion in it. And I would just kind of look around and see if anybody else actually hears that, not me. But it's amazing that these people have worked so hard in the audio business that they have trained their ears to hear such things as that. And to me, that's a testament to this product because it is an amazing tool. You can do all, it adds very musical color when you use it. And uh, one of the th situations the where I have used it myself and not even turn the EQ on is like when I've mixed with someone who doesn't want to use the transformer emulation and they were sharing head amps, I will put the insert that on the channel so I'll get the transformer emulation on the channels. Well, I think that's your f best first step. If you're mixing on a Revage and you've got Rios, go through and put that on every single channel to start out with and you're going to have... Yeah, and there's plenty of DSP to do so. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's pretty incredible. I know that um, when introduced to this piece, the high pass filter, just those, those shelf filters, even the drive function, it's, it's so incredibly musical. I mean, it's just mind blowing just to go through it, like you said, and hear the transformer, but then to hear all of the, the EQ filters and, and to move something, hear it, but it's just such a rich, buttery, full sound. Yeah, it's a great piece. Yeah, thanks, Chris. That, that was pretty, 
pretty fantastic. Um, Russ, the next thing I was curious about is walk me through, um, I'm going to pull this up. There's another compressor on here that is also fantastic, and you've talked about it a lot. Walk me through this 5043 compressor. Man, it is just a great, a great piece. It's uh, my go-to compressor for, uh, for vocals, although I use it on, on you know, acoustic instruments and, and electric guitars too, but it's, uh, it's just does something amazing to the sound. And, um, and it actually sounds great even if you're not compressing, just to put it in the chain because of the circuit being modeled. Uh, it, it, it just does this kind of, I don't know if it's beefing it up exactly, but, but everything sounds better when it's, when it's on. And, um, and the compression sounds real natural and you can put quite a bit of compression on vocals without it sounding squash, but yet it controls the dynamics and um, it's really, really a fantastic, fantastic piece. I, I like it. It's, it's amazing to me that uh, on this compressor that you, it automatically shows up their defaults with 4 dB of gain in it. And if you have your gain structure pretty close, you drop it in and it'll automatically drop into 4 dB of compression and the, right. you can actually punch it in and out and, and not really hear a big gain difference other than kind of leveling out what right. it, you're doing. It's, they, it's obviously they've spent a lot of time making compressors. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's been a pretty cool piece. I know that you guys have talked about it and I've seen other engineers use it. And so I've enjoyed getting to use it a bit myself, um, as well as being able to use both the feedback and feed forward design of it. And like you said, from um, almost reamping, being able to go through it and it adds a, a gain stage, it adds some transformer and some texture. It, it's just a really great piece that brings a lot of life into whatever you put it onto. Chris, one more thing that uh, is in that, that Rupert Neve line is the Portico 5045, and you have an amazing story about this piece. And this is a fantastic piece that has come out, and it has saved a lot of guys' bacon from corporate events with lobs and headsets where they need more gain before feedback to award shows, uh, even to uh, touring acts that have artists that perform out in front of the PA on a thrust or in a B stage or something. And um, this is a really unique piece that... Uh, Rupert has come up with, but your backstory on this is amazing. Tell us about this piece and how you first came across it. Well, our first trip to Rupert Neve Designs down in Texas, uh, I, we were discussing different things and, uh, and I have a mutual friend that lives down there that's very good friends with Rupert and he had told him my name for some reason and all of a sudden I walk in he goes, hey Chris, we have our mutual friend and I just like going you know who, who I am but anyway so during our conversations during the day he uh, uh, asked me if I would take this thing he had built in a bud box out and try it out live because he felt like it was a, a live piece and not a recording piece and they did not do any live stuff and of course if Rupert Neve asked you to try a beta product or <laughs> you know, he said yeah of course yeah, absolutely. so I took it out to some production jobs that I was doing. I was working for David Foster at the time and we would do shows and there was always uh, announcers and stuff and I put it on and I couldn't tell what it was doing. So it scared me. So I disconnected it because I couldn't really tell exactly what it was doing. It was doing something but I wasn't for sure. But the production mixer asked me if he could try it. So he put it on his lavalier microphones and his uh, podium mics and he used it. I didn't pay much attention to what he was doing. Then after the show, he did not want to give it back to me. He offered me $2,000, $3,000 for it if I would give it to him because it saved him hours of tuning. And I said, no, no, I had to actually pull it out of his hands. And so through all of that, we, uh, we discussed back and forth about building this product. And Rupert Neve actually, Rupert Neve Designs actually built this product in an analog, in an analog piece, and people started using it. And to be honest with you, I'm not really sure how it works, but it seems to lower the ambience or lower the feedback level or lower the level when people are not talking, and it does it in an incredible way that you don't really notice it being there. And um, so they built this analog product and over time Yamaha with their association with Rupert Neve made it into a, uh, a digital plug-in which 
can only be found in the Yamaha products. Yeah, I, I carried that with me as a hardware device for years before it came out as a plug-in because it became, I just considered it an essential device for mixing a show for somebody who sings softly. And, um, and it works, works wonders. And the plug-in is identical to the hardware piece. So it's, uh, it's pretty awesome. And there's a couple of other great uh, production-oriented products inside of this uh, console. Uh, there's the dance plug-in, uh, which can work hand-in-hand -hand with the 5045 as well, which um, can drop down background noise. Uh, I know uh, anything from ambient noise to fan noise to air conditioner noise, I mean, it can bring that out of uh, choir mics, it can bring it out of string mics, it can bring it out of vocal mics, um, and it can help you get more level, more gain before feedback as well. So it, it can work hand in hand with the, with the 5045. And there's also the Dan Dugan auto mixer, which if you're dealing with multiple uh, speakers on stage at the same time, it works wonders. And, uh, and it's all built into the console and standard in, in the Rivage platform. Yeah, we've gotten um, a lot of people because of the Dan Dugan having 64 channels of it in the Revage system. Yeah, I was going to say that's being, a it's turning into a, a big deal for you know uh, political events and all types right. of things that that because it doesn't have to be external anymore. Right, and that Dan du the processing for the Dan Dugan is not using uh, the the plugin dedicated processing, so you actually. You, it doesn't take away from how many plugins you're able to use, so it's it, it's really a lot of processing power inside of the desk. Yeah, yeah, that that's a very powerful piece, and especially 64 channels. I mean, that that's incredible to be able to have that many sources, and it automatically writing and controlling that stuff. Guys, I just want to say thank you so much for coming out, for being a part of this uh, CTS event. And uh, thank you guys for joining us for our discussion in the Rivage PM platform and uh, the PM5, PM10. It's been a pleasure. Thank you guys. Yeah. Thanks yeah. for having us. Yeah. Glad to do it. Well, that was fun. Thanks for joining us for the Yamaha Rivage PM5 Episode 2. So keep an eye out for us on social media. We've got a lot more planned for you. Where next time, we'll be live from the CTS Learning Lab.